And it's welcome to this condensed history of BSA motorcycles. No way can we give you the complete story, such as the long and detailed career of this historic firm. The Birmingham Small Arms Association was formed as long ago as 1855 when the company manufactured firearms. Then in 1880, Mr. Otto demonstrated his die cycle to the company by actually writing it on the boardroom table. In this year, the BSA company adopted their pile of arms trademark. 1905 saw the first motorcycle powered by a Minerva engine. And in 1913, a BSA won a race at the famous Brooklyn circuit at an average speed of 60.75 miles per hour. In 1919, the BSA Cycles Limited was formed, and this same year they announced the famous Model E, a 770cc side valve twin. The following years saw the arrival of a many and varied selection of motorcycles. I don't believe any other manufacturer ever produced such a wide range of two-wheeled transport. Through the 50s and 60s, BSA did their best at keeping up with progress, designing and building unit singles and twins. In 1968, a three-cylinder machine hit the headlines, the 750cc rocket. There's certainly no time here to list the number of awards achieved by BSA and their riders, but despite this, the 70s saw BSA devastated by heavy trade losses. In 1977, sadly, the small heath factory was demolished. We will do our best now to show you a good cross-section of the bikes produced by BSA, thousands still giving reliable service and enjoyment to their owners. We go over now to Abbey Hill Rally, held at Yeovil in Somerset every year, where we, first of all, we find the famous D1 Bantam. This one, the plunger model, noted because of the springing at the back. And this proud lady owner not only brings it to rallies, but she performs a lot on that machine, road, uh, runs during the year, some very long runs indeed. Another famous Bantam there. The Bantam, of course, was um, uh, an idea, a design idea, was pinched from DKW just after World War II, but it had become, I suppose, the most popular of all um, lightweight two-stroke motorcycles. Here we've got a bigger version here because they started off with 123cc and they built the 150 and later on the 175. It went on for many, many years at the Bantam series. Later producing swinging arm suspension. One of the famous C models, the C11 here, this was uh, an early model with girder forks. Most of these were produced later with the tellies. This was a little coil ignition 250 overhead valve bike. Three speed gearbox, not the motorcycle enthusiast bike, but someone who wanted cheap transport from A to B. They had everybody in mind at BSAs with great success. Always pick out that old BSA back mud guard with the ridge down the middle of it too. There she is, the C11, the girder fork model. That must be the one of the early ones just after World War II. Another proud Bantam owner here, showing off his original Bristol registration. Just a little grid carrier on the back mud guard there, but some of them put a pillion on to take the uh, passenger on, not a very fast performer with two up, but nevertheless a reliable little motor indeed. Now it's bigger brother now, this is the 500cc A7 twin, it's parallel twins starting back in the late 40s and this is a, a model here of the 50s I believe and back again to the 250s, this time the C12. Now you saw the C11 earlier, but the C12 was uh, a little more advanced, having a four-speed gearbox. Still designed as a commuter's bike. A couple of proud BSA owners there, and another proud BSA owner here is the owner of this old side bulb um, 500cc single. This is a bike designed for sidecar purposes. Just a simple machine there. Look at the brakes on the front of it. None of your modern disc braking there. Hand change, 
on the big footboards there to make it more comfortable riding and change. You can just see the top of the oil pump where you fed your oil through by your own hand pressure. That was primitive riding back in the old original BSA days and they were producing some wonderful machines even then. And a very comfortable pillion too. This is another famous BSA, this is the BSA Sloper. That was very popular back in the 30s. You had a BSA Sloper, then you had one of the best of the uh, real road going machines. I think that's a 500cc version of it. It's got what they call a twin port head and you can see the um, twin Brooklyn's uh, silencers sticking out at the back there. Yeah, quite a reliable and popular tourer. Another 250 um, successes was the C-Rays, the C-15. This was based on the uh, Triumph engine of the uh, Tiger Cub series, but of course BSA had acquired Triumphs and they had every right to do this. They made the engine a bit bigger and put it upright instead of the slight slope you saw on the Triumph versions. Very good little bike this, and they made a bigger version into a three, in the 350, the B40, which was a, a very popular um, bike in competition world and well used by the British Army. Very clean design was the C15. Light to handle and pleasure to ride, and so was this old 252. Back in the uh, 1930s is the uh, date of this one. You see the hand chains and the push rods going up the side there. An unrestored looking bike. I love to see them like this. It just gives you some idea how well they were put together in the first place to stay in reasonable condition for so many, many years. You had to be ashamed to restore that, I think. It's nice to see it in its natural state. Happy BSA owner there on his C15. It's the attractive blue model. Of course, through the 60s, uh, bikes became much prettier, didn't they? Um, to compete with the Japanese imports, and this is what uh, saw the end of the British motorcycle industry, unfortunately. We tried to progress, but we were still hung on to our past. There's one of the last of the Bantams, the 175cc. Now we go over to the South Wales BSA Owners Clubs and chat to some of the proud owners there. This is one of the, the meetings that the BSA Owners Club has, the branches. Each branch has their own camping weekend. This is the South West Wales Camping Weekend in Lampenis near Carmarthen. And um, we, we have them all over the country during the summer. Well, and winter come to that. And, um, you know, and we probably get 30, 30 bikes at each meeting, although we have got 4,000 members na nationally, but um, not all turn up, as you, as you understand. And as we're all getting older, less and less turns up. Uh, well, this is a B30, well, BSA B31, a 350cc bike. I bought it two and a half years ago, already restored. And... Um, we, we take it around the shows, well I ride it as well, it's MOT'd and what have you, and we take it around the shows and put it on the club stands. And um, I'm, at one of the rallies we went to, we, we met the chap that used to ride it around the fields as a youngster. So uh, it's been around a bit, but it has got a Glamorgan number plate on it, so it's more or less still, still at home, if you know what I mean. And that, and um, it's... It's firstly as it come out of the factory, because um, in 1953 when this came out of the factory, the Korean War was on and there was a lack of chrome. And so th this is one of the models that was never had the tank chromed, because most BSAs uh, in 52 and 54 got a chrome tank. But this, as it was the Korean War was on, there was a lack of um, chrome. But um, other than that, it's virtually standard except it's got stainless steel spokes and nuts and bolts on it now. It's less clean in that way.
VSA Owners Club was uh, formed as, an, as a national club in 1958. Uh, before that, we had a BSA clubs all over the UK, well, four or five of them, and they were all doing the same thing, but different. So uh, they all got together and formed this national BSA club. And in the day, and then I joined uh, back in the early 60s, uh, when there was only about 300 members. And now we're up to 4,000 members in, in the UK alone. Um, uh, my job in the early days as public relations officer was creating new branches. We used to go off and create new branches, through, uh, either through the press or um, uh, events and things like that. And now we've got something like 21 to 25 branches in the UK. And besides that, we've now got around about 30 or 40 clubs in, in, in the world. We've got um, four or five in America. In America, We've got uh, three or four in Australia. And each year, all these clubs do get together. Uh, at an international rally. Um, next year, the big international rally is being held in Australia. Uh, the bikes are being shipped over um, and the members will travel over independently and meet up with their bikes later on. This year, uh, next in three weeks' time, is the big international rally in Holland. Um, it's a unique rally for motorcycle clubs. I, I believe it's the only motorcycle club in the whole world that has a week's rally. Most, most rallies are only held for weekends, but we have been running our international rallies now for some 38 years, and they are a comprise of a week. Uh, they're very, very um, controlled. Uh, they, they must meet a standard. We have a dinner dance, we have uh, bus trips out so that the bikes are rested for a day. Um, we have uh, club runs out obviously nearly every day. Uh, and you must be a BSA owner to attend. The BSA Club um, branch at South West Wales was formed about, um, I think it's three years ago now, by myself uh, and uh, Paul Davis that I've known for years. Because um, I've always been into BSAs and uh, we had a BSA Club in Wiltshire, uh, which I ran for um, from 1968 up until when I moved to Wales uh, in 1989. And I uh, always wanted to start another BSA club because there were so many BSAs about. Um, we're lucky we've got a good uh, working club because uh, f over those three years we've now built up to one of the, one of the biggest branches in the UK, which is uh, some 55 members or so. Um, we do all sorts really. We, uh, we have talks, um, club runs out. Um, uh, we have inter-club inter uh, activities with um, all-mate clubs from Carmarthen and the, and the surrounding area. Every year we have one of these uh, camping weekends. Um, each branch, we have about 21 branches in the UK and um, we're the only branch left in Wales now. And uh, each branch takes it in turns to put on a weekend, normally running from Friday to uh, Sunday evening, uh, sometimes over bank holidays, where we invite all the other branches from the UK and in actual fact all the other clubs from uh, Europe to come and uh, visit and bring their BSAs. Things have changed a little in the, uh, to what it used to be. Most people now decide to bring their bikes on trailers rather than ride them the whole of the journey. But then we take them out on a, a club run like we've done today, some 55 miles, um, all up through what we call one of the most picturesque areas of Wales, up through um, uh, Pimp Saint and uh, up through the gold mines and run right up through the valley to um, to Limbriani, uh, and then they return back then on, on some decent roads, uh, back through Randy Moyne and uh, through Clandovery back home again. I bought this 1948 BSA M21 about two years ago. I was also already a member of the Triumph Owners Club, so about three months ago I joined the BSA Owners Club. Uh, I restored it myself. I got quite a bit of a problem with the engine. I had it reboard and new big ends, new bearings and all the rest of it. I ride it quite a lot most weekends, especially when the weather's nice. We just come back now on it. <laughs> and uh, it's been quite a good old plodder. It goes quite well, starts easily. It's actually an old sidecar bike, which is what they were made for originally. <coughs> It has a side valve 600cc engine. It's got a separate pillion seat on it. It's not very comfortable to ride on, but 
does the job. I've been interested in motorcycles since I was a teenager. I've always, I used to have a lot of them, but then I, I left them alone for a long time. But in the last five or six years, I've gone back into them because it gives me something to do in my spare time. And I've always been, I am an engineer by trade, and it gives me a bit of engineering to fiddle around with old bikes. <laughs> Rather than new bikes, I don't have anything to do with modern bikes. Only any before about 1975, I'm quite interested in. But uh, you know, any make, any model, more or less. It's a 1957 uh, BSA Bantam, which uh, was used with the uh, General Post Office for uh, delivering telegraphs, and um, this one was used in the Planetli Post Office between 57 and 1960. Um, it was bought in nearly complete uh, condition and uh, restored by myself over the um, takes about a year. But I've actually had the bike for about uh, six years. Getting the bits and pieces to finish it off, um, like the first aid box and uh, the uh, plasters and the plastic container inside, you know, it's pretty hard. Yeah. But um, you go down to auto jumbles and uh, you, you actually find them in the end. Um, that's okay. about it, really. Okay. Camera running now. The uh, actual leg shields uh, I picked up in uh, Stafford in the. Uh, in the auto jumble up there and uh, the transfers I had of, of a lady in Scotland which um, she, she owns about uh, 20 of them herself and uh, her husband used to actually uh, ride the bikes back in the 40s and 50s. When you're actually looking for the parts the main thing is most of the parts are stamped with the GPO stamp so when you're picking parts up you try and get them with the actual stamp on it you know it's um, it's been a great pleasure owning this bike you know and rebuilding it and uh, I'll still have it in 50 years time if I'm still alive you know uh, so it gives a lot of other people enjoyment just to look at it as well you know I've been involved since a teenager with bikes I still got the A7 I originally had I can done that up as well but um, I learned on a Bantam, that's why I bought this one five years ago. And it's just ideal for these kinds of roads up around this area as well. Beautiful. Well, this is the uh, D14. It's one of the last ones they did. It's 1968. And it's got the four gears. That's a big advantage, the, the extra gear. Go that little bit faster. Not the fast, but a bit faster. Yeah, lovely. Very economical. Runs on unleaded petrol. with Because the modern petrol now, the oil to go with it is good so that makes it cheap as well good reasonable good runner very reliable touch wood yeah <laughs> yeah nice little bike the Bantam's always been a very popular bike especially for learning very popular and that's why I like to take it to a local show or any show people come up to me and talk about it or I've either got still got bits of these in this garage or shed or their father or father not got one very popular. I think that's why I, I do get a lot of, uh, meet a lot of nice people. Uh, yeah, they all say, oh, I got bits and that. Very good. And still going strong in the year 2000. So I think, yes, very good bike.
the original owner of this bike. He, um, he bought it as it is. He drove it from 59 through to about 70. Then um, he put it in the garage, took it apart, and then it stayed there until he died in 86. And um, it saw light again, a day, and then again when his son um, got it MOT'd in 86 uh, to sell it, basically. And it was sold to a dealer, and uh, it still didn't go out. The dealer split it up and sold the bike separately. And the chap did 40 miles on it, didn't like it, brought it back to the same dealer and the chap I bought it from happened to go into the into the garage four years ago after a motorcycle and sidecar and he put it together for him and and that's it and that's how I got it. I saw the bike advertised over near Norwich um, in one of the in one of the motorcycle books and uh, we decided to go and look at it and as soon as we saw it we bought it. Um, A10 1959 um, done 27 and a half thousand miles from you um, it's been stored for 11 or 12 years um, and it's only done 450 miles since 1986 so you know it's um it, and it's in, it's in very good condition really for the year um it, the sidecar the outfit itself is as original it, it was bought by the chap originally it's a stoib tr 500 um it's uh, one of the, there were later models, but this is, this is one of the sort of mid middle range models. Um, and uh, it's a very good sidecar, heavy frame, you know, it's lasted very well, steel body. And uh, it's, uh, I like it. <laughs>this particular bike is uh, a 1959 uh, BSA ASM shooting star 500cc uh, I bought the bike about five years ago and uh, over the last five years I've done most of the uh, renovation work on it myself uh, the engine was rebuilt by a professionals and uh, over the last four years, I've uh, I've now used quite a lot of the bike. I've shown it successfully in many shows, and uh, she's been totally reliable uh, over the last four or five years. Uh, I bought it uh, from an, an owner down in the West Country, and uh, the bike was actually complete when I bought her, but she was uh, she needed uh, a total restoration work. And I started the restoration work about five five years ago, and uh, this is the uh, the result, the end result on it, like.
My particular bike is a BSA Barracuda, made in 1967. It's basically a, a stage between the C15 and the Starfire. I've owned the bike for about six years now, and I managed to trace the history back to when it was originally delivered back in Kent, I believe in 67, when it was originally red, and red in colour, which is a bit of a rarity because they're mostly orange or blue. The Barracuda, was a 250cc in, it, in its day, was a sports learner 250 of its time, but uh, because of that, it's very fragile and even though it will scoot around quite quickly, it will, won't do it for very long. So when you do ride it, if you uh, treat it a little bit of respect, hopefully it'll pay you back with a, a reasonably long life. I've had the bike now for six years, and in that time it's had a mechanical rebuild, and its, uh, it's longest journey it's ever done was a three-day trip to Inverness about two years ago for the International BSA Rally in Scotland. And apart from one or two small electrical problems, she behaved very well all the way there and all the way back. So I intend to keep her for as long as I can and just keep pouring money into her. Hopefully not too fast. My traction of BSAs, I've always had a, a, an interest in them, I think since uh, I've been re reading motorcycle magazines, but uh, they're easy going machines, they're not too complicated. They're, they're not trying to keep up with the times, obviously because their factory's closed now, but they're just nice club bikes to ride around on with like-minded people and enjoy yourself and not have to race around at super fast speeds. You can have a pleasant afternoon's ride, not go mad and enjoy it. I'm the owner of a BSA Rocket 3, it's known as an A75, it's a 750cc motorcycle. 
It's the last of the BSA range, uh, three cylinder, and the one that was brought out to compete with the Hondas that was just coming into the country. Um, unfortunately, it was just a little too little too late, and we saw the factory go down from there. I've had the machine some eight, nine years now, and it's a superb machine. It, uh, it's taken me all over Europe. This year it's been to Belgium, into France, and almost up to Norway. We didn't quite make that one, but not because of the bike, because of me. Um, I own nearly 20 motorcycles, most of them BSAs, and that's got to be the best one I've got. I became the owner of the bike some seven or eight years ago, and I bought it because I'd always want, wanted one as a young man. I'd actually raced one for a little while um, for a sponsor, but never could afford to own one. So as I got older, the children moved off, I was able to afford what I want, and the BSA Rocket 3 was one of the first things I bought. Um, as I say, the road bike is very similar to the racing bike, and I've been very happy with it. That particular bike was uh, not a wreck, but it had been hard done by, and I bought it and reconditioned it, and it's run seven years, four or five thousand miles, with no real troubles at all. A superb machine. motorcycle is a 1960 BSA Super Rocket. 
Uh, I've added about 12 months now, um, done total restoration on this model. Um, the chap I bought it off, uh, it had been in the, his garage for 20 years with no spark plugs in and originally was in calf race style. Um, so I've spent a lot of time going to auto jumbles and various shows and trying to get the correct bits to put it back to as you see it today. Um, I'm very pleased it's come out like this. Um, still a few more things to finish, but uh, not much more, hopefully. <laughs> A large sum of money. It spent uh, six months in my front room actually when I was rebuilding it, so I was very understanding why. But uh, it's a 650 twin cylinder, uh, pre unit motorcycle um, of uh, pre unit motorcycle. It's actually, again, this is actually uh, 10 years older than me. Um, my particular interest, I, I, I prefer the BSA really to many motorcycles because they don't actually make BSAs anymore, whereas they still manufacture Triumphs. Um, the, the parts are still quite easy to get really, there's a lot of places you can get them for, Kidderminster Motorcycles and various other places and of course the BSA Club are always a great help to get the parts for it. Um, so you know, it's, it's something I suppose is heritage, because being only 30 years old myself it's just something that I think the young people should get into, um, because otherwise the bikes just uh, you know, end up being lost in time really, um, and that's mainly why I like the BSA. This is a 1957 BSA Rocky Gold Star replica of a 1962 version. It's, um, can I say it's been converted to twin carburetors? Uh, there's Gold Star mud guards on it. It's a genuine Gold Star racing tank. It's a five gala Latea tank. As you can see, it's um, been converted to rod back brake instead of cable. The um, front brake is an eight inch version, single sided tube, which I find is a better brake altogether. What appeals to me about this particular BSA is phenomenal, it's brilliant to ride sounds awesome um, it's just too comfortable to put in the clubman's position so I left it in the touring position it's uh, unbelievable to write spares parts uh, not so bad um, some bits are like rocking off awesome manure to get out of you can't get out of them but uh, everything else you can get parts for Now we're going to have a look at another rally now. This is the Castle Coombe Rally in Wiltshire. Always a good selection of bikes here and of course plenty of BSAs as well. So let's hope we can sort out just a few of the gems there. As I said before, we won't find all the BSAs on a video of this length, but we will try and find real gems. Nice start there with one of the uh, A7 Star Twins. That attractive green finish. Isn't that a beautiful bike? Typical of the BSA finish and design. They always designed a good bike and an attractive bike too, which made so many happy and proud owners. The Star models, of course, were um, the top of the range. That famous a7 engine there. Very similar to the A10, which was just bit bigger horsepower, the 650. But they give a lot of satisfaction throughout the years. Here we are, our old friend back again with the sidecar on, complete with the um, carbide container tent there. You to put water on that to make the actual lighting. There was very little electronics in the PSAs of that era. Or any other machines come to that hard to realize how they work now that we're in this uh, 
age of the computer. But whatever happened with those bikes, it was a result of you doing it. There was nothing to help you electronically at all. It was all... The result was what you fed into it. Another of the last of the B31s, this was a very famous range, a 350 big single. They built a 500 version as well. Um, the, the 31 was a, a very popular 350, rugged and reliable. Became a little bit heavy towards its end, but here we have the BSA logo with the famous pile of arms um, trademark. Fine example of a fine bit of machinery. real attractive engine. And of course the Gold Star engines were based on this B-series engine but being fitted with alloy blocks. There's the little C11. We saw one over at Abbey Hill with the girder forks on. This is the, uh, the later and the more popular production model with a speedometer in the top of the tank. And of course there's no chrome on that tank. This would be around about 1952 when there was a chrome shortage and uh, BSAs and other manufacturers had to use a bit more paint. The rims, instead of chrome finish, were what they called cadmium finished. Good optimistic speedometer that'll take you right up to 90, but I doubt if you get up to the further than the 60 on the level on a little 250C11. Very reliable, and as I said before, so it's easy to start. The ideal cheap commuter machine. And I see he's also a member of the BSA Owners Club. Good for him. Ideal way to keep in touch with other BSA owners and uh, useful for obtaining spare parts, which are quite plentiful. Another nice uh, A7 twin in red and chrome. Belonged to a very uh, happy motorcycling couple from Western Super Mary. Know that bike only too well. Once again, a good example of BSA's attractive design. By this time, you see the full width hub, and the brakes on the front, and here, the daddy of them all, the BSA Gold Star. Nobody won as many Club Beans TT races as the BSA Gold Stars. They really took the field and led the way, and even now, a lot of the classic um, motorcycle racing enthusiasts will um, own a BSA Gold Star. It really has a wonderful history in any form of competition that famous BSA star, Gold Star Singles. There she is. You see the similarity in the uh, timing cover there as the, the B series we saw, but it's uh, hotted up a bit inside, I can assure you. And the sound of a BSA Gold Star single, second to none. It's got a crackle of its own. Oh, how I wish they were with us now. But it's still nice to go around to the rallies and shows and see that famous name and hear those nostalgic sounds of that wonderful British make. A very popular motorcycle, BSA.